This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Oi, Brazil! Oi. All right, I'm impressed. Very good. Excellent. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is a special episode recorded on October 1st, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today I am coming to you from Brazil, about an hour by air outside of Sao Paulo. We are in the town of Ribeirão Preto. All right. I practice that every night. <laughs> and we're at the 25th annual meeting of the Brazilian Society for Virology. And of course, this is my second trip uh, to Brazil. We did a TWIV at the same meeting two years ago. So I guess we did a good job because we're back. And so thank you for having us back. And uh, we're going to do another one here today. I was just looking at the weather here in Hebreu Preto. It is 33 degrees Celsius. It's pretty warm, but it is sunny outside, 42% humidity, and winds out of the southwest at 10 kilometers per hour. Really nice day here in Brazil. So I have collected some of the participants uh, at this meeting. And first, all the way down the table there, my good friend, Eurico Arruda. Hi Welcome. there. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Eurico is at the university. <laughs> you know, I always had trouble pronouncing his first name, and he said to me, just think of it being, hey, Eurico. Oh, no. No, no, I didn't even get the, hey, Eurico. <laughs> hey, Eurico. You did it just perfect. Thank you. Uh, Eurico is from the University of Sao Paulo School of Medicine here in Hiberao Preto. I love saying that, isn't that great? <laughs> can we have the meeting again here so I can do that again? Uh, Eurico is the current president of the Brazilian Society for Virology, right? Yes. And how interesting that I happen to be the president of the American Society. Yeah, we have two presidents here. So we are anchoring a table here, the presidents. <laughs> but we have no secret service or anything. <laughs> uh, so thanks for having me back. And in between the two of us, we have some young virologists. We decided to focus on young people, some postdocs mainly, and a very, very new assistant professor. This is the future of Brazilian virology. Well, some of it, of course, because there are many other futures out there in the audience as well. So we decided to talk a little bit about them and their careers. So right here on my left, from the University of Sao Paulo School of Medicine, here in Hibrão Preto, <laughs> Gustavo Akrani. Thank you very much for having me here, for inviting me for this. It's a huge pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Is that right, Gustavo Akrani or Akrani? Yes, yes. Akrani. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us. Vincent, do you know that Akrani means headless, right? It does, oh. really? Yeah, it's from Italian. Headless. Uh, cr crani, it's uh, the yeah, cranium. Right, head, right, right, so right. Acranium. Is that right, Jeremy Lubin? Yeah. It means headless? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And to Gustavo's left. Now, this will be harder for me. I haven't practiced this. At Universidad Estadual Paulista, San Jose de Rio Preto. <laughs> Cynthia Bitar. Hi. Welcome. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's a great Welcome. pleasure to be here, too. Welcome to TWIV. Next to Cynthia from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Tatiana Dimitrovic. Hello, Vincent. Welcome to TWIL. <laughs> Thank you very much. And finally, from the Federal University of Lavras, Minas Gerais, Sue Ellen Galvino Costa. Um, hello, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. How, is it said Lavras? Is that the way to say it? Yeah, Lavras. La, Lavras and Minas Gerais, is that correct? Yeah, Gerai. Minas Gerais. Okay, Minas Gerai. 
You know, I'm Italian, so I sort of can do some of this. Um, you know, many, um, I was, my father was born in Italy, and many of my family moved to Brazil 30 years ago uh, during the war, World War II. And they're somewhere here in this country. Any relatives of mine here? No? Okay. All right, so that's our, uh, the future of Brazilian virology. Today we're going to talk with these uh, individuals. We do have a really nice audience from the meeting, and uh, we appreciate your coming and uh, eating your lunch. Enjoy it. All right. I want to start first by finding out from each of you where you were born and raised and educated. And we'll start with you, Gustavo. Well, maybe it's not going to be a very fun story because I was born here in Ribeirão Preto. <laughs> I, well, of course, I went to school here and I graduated here at the University of Sao Paulo in mm -hmm. biology. <laughs> I did my master's PhD and postdoc here and a little bit in Scotland. So late on, I moved on to Scotland okay. and, and I'm back here. So. Here, Ribeirão Preto. All right, that's okay. It's a very, very simple story. You'd be surprised how many people have similar stories. They tend to stay where they are born and go through all of their education. It happens often on TWIV, we have people like that. So yeah, I was lucky because we have a great university and schools here, so I was just lucky. Cynthia, tell us where you're from. Okay, I'm from Santos. It's a city in the coast of the state of São Paulo. And when I went to the university, then I went to uh, São José do Rio Preto. And uh, I'm, there, I'm there since that time, because I did my graduation there, mm -hmm. and then master's, PhD. Uh, during my PhD, I went to St. Louis, so I lived there for a short period, about six months. And then I came back and started to do my postdoc, and I'm still there. So I don't know what's going to happen from now, but... Right, yeah, many of us do not know what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, were born in a city not... in the state of Sao Paulo, right? It's in the state of Sao Paulo, the coast. On the coast, south of Sao Paulo, the city, or north? Uh, south. South of it. South. And you, you went to university there? You know, um, in s University in São José do Rio Preto. So where is that located? Uh, it's... Um, it's Rio Preto? Yeah, it's nearby. It's about uh, two hours okay. by car. It's, what, 200 kilometers? Yeah, yeah 200 kilometers from yeah. here. Okay. Very close. It. So you it's were university close. there and PhD there as well? Yeah, master's and, and PhD. And your postdoc? Uh, there, too. There, same yeah. place? Yeah. So uh, she's like you, she didn't yeah. really go yeah. far. I just went to two cities, you know. At, le at least she <laughs> left the city, yeah, that's true. Okay. Tatiana, where are you from? Hi, I, I was born in Sao Paulo, the city of Sao Paulo, but I was raised in Vitoria, which is the capital of a small state mm -hmm. here in the southeast. I did my undergraduation there in the Federal University of Espírito Santo, and then I went, moved to Rio to do my master's and PhD. And now I'm returning to Rio. So you're our young assistant professor, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Now your name is not particularly Brazilian. What, not is at your all. family from somewhere else, I presume? Yeah, my father was born in Croatia and he came around the 70s to work in Brazil. And my, my grandma and my grandpa from my mother's side, they are also from Yugoslavia but they okay. came uh, during the Second World War. Right. So not really uh, Brazilian genes, but Got it. No, the environment is totally said, Brazilian. My family did the same thing. Many of them came from Italy to Brazil. I think they settled around Brasilia, but I never found out where they were. During the war, they didn't want to stay in Italy. Uh, Sue Ellen, where are you from? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was born in a, a small city, close, very close to Lavras. Uh, it's called Ribeirão Vermelho. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was like with just a few months, like in the maximum, I guess, one year old, then my, I and my family we moved to Lavras, and uh, I uh, under, made the undergraduation in the Federal University of Lavras, and start with. Uh, master and go straight to the PhD mm -hmm. there too and 
And uh, during the PhD, I was to University of Idaho, spent one year there, yeah. back and uh, start a new project with the same uh, department uh, working with the same okay. things there. Very good. And hey, Eureka, we know all about you because the last TWIV we asked you about it, right? Yep, you did. Do you want to know it again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I was born on a state up north, Maranhão, and then I moved to another state up north, Ceará, where I went to medical school. Uh -huh. And then um, after that, I took master's and PhD at the uni Federal University of Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo City. And then I lived for a number of years in Charlottesville, Virginia. And then I came here to Ribeirão Preto almost two decades ago. Right. Okay. So one thing you heard in common among all these individuals is that they went somewhere else for a couple of years to do some research. And I, I really want to explore that and why we do that and, and what you learn. Uh, but I want to first ask all of you how you got interested in science. You've all pursued careers in science. <clears throat> You're on a track to become you know, scientists of one kind or another. What, what motivated you? What got you interested in science? Can you tell us, Gustavo? Well, well uh, I cannot remember the, the <laughs> let's say, the first spark that made me, made me fell in love with uh, science. But it's from since I was a little kid, I always enjoyed uh, things related to nature. That, that, that's why I, I went to the biologist. And when I was doing my undergrad, I was really interested in monkey behavior. And I even did some, some how do you call some, some, some work collecting, um, running around monkeys in the, in the jungle, collecting stool to see. All the people who, who work with this uh, know what I'm talking about. So, uh, but then <laughs> I went to, I had this friend of mine who is now a professor at the University of Campinas, Uni, Unicamp, Jose Luis. He was doing research in, with bacteria during his undergraduate. So he called me and I started doing some stuff with him. And I just fell in love with the microbes. And I did my master's with bacteria with Marcelo Brocchi, who is now a, a professor at Unicamp also. But then well, in the same department, Eurico was there. And I went to his lectures and to his class. And it is impossible. I know that people here have seen him talking about viruses. It's just like you, he's, he, he's in love with this and he captivates you. So I was hooked by virology and I learned how to, to love viruses with him. So I just, I finished my master's and I asked him, uh, do you have a space for me in your lab? So, and he accepted me and that, that's it. So what were you doing collecting monkey stool? What were you looking for? <laughs> oh, you, you have to see what the, the kind of things that they eat. I see. So, okay. so it, I, I didn't last my, I, I, I was made to be inside of, um, it's very hot here, isn't it? So imagine no, if you stay cool here, here. <laughs> you stay outside collecting stool. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd rather stay in a, that people say that I'm, um, uh, how do you call the, the air conditioner biologist? Because I stay in the, but I'm not, I don't feel any bad about that. But you're still a crap collector. Crab collector. crab collector. Oh, I collect cra uh, chicken crab for a while. Uh, but this, this is another story. <laughs> I, I ask because Beatri Beatrice Hahn uh, has people collecting monkey feces in, uh, in Africa, and she's, of course, the person who figured out the origin of HIV by doing that, by collecting uh, feces. But she calls it something else. She doesn't call it crap or feces. And we, this is a family show, so I don't want to say it. <laughs> but in English, it begins with S. Oh, okay, I figured it out. Okay. She says, I have an army of S collectors in Africa. Anyway, thank you. Uh, Cynthia, what about you? Um, when I was in school, little girl. You still are, right? Uh, yeah, I'm still a little girl. <laughs> uh, my two favorite classes were history and bio, uh, science at the time. Uh, this, was, and this was in... Excuse me, this was high school or no, university? No, uh, before high school. Elementary. <coughs> Elementary, yeah. And uh, then, when I was in high school, then I had the genetics in biology. Mm -hmm. So that 
just I thought, whoa, this is cool. It was like simple information that we have in high school, but I thought, okay, this maybe this is what I want to do. So that's why I went to do uh, biology. Uh, but when I was in the university, maybe because I always liked science, uh, before I went to study genetics and more specifically virus, uh, I did other stuff like uh, paleobiology, some, some scientific initi initiation paleobiology, just to see if that's really what I wanted. Uh, so I found out that there was a researcher in the institute, which is the one I'm still uh, in her lab today, uh, Dr. Paula Howe, and uh, she worked with virus. And I thought, okay, genetics? If I work with virus, I must work with genetics. And they are such uh, interesting organisms. So that's when I went to talk to her and got a place in her lab, which wasn't very easy to get, but uh, I got it. And uh, then I just fell in love with it. At first, I worked with uh, uh, RSCV, human respiratory syncytial virus, and then I started w working with hepatitis C. So I think that's it. Okay. So this is a first on TWIV. We have table service here. <laughs> Can we order something? <laughs> Thank what you. What do you want? Do you want beer? No, no, no. Late, later, later. later. Okay. Tatiana, how did you get interested in science? Um, it's hard to tell as well. Well, when I was a kid, I was crazy about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, at that time, it's not like now that you have a lot of dinosaur stuff to, yeah. for kids. So my uncle gave me a, a very technical book about paleontology. And I think since then, I realized that uh, in high school, we were not really getting the real stuff, mm -hmm. how you, you get the knowledge. So this curiosity always uh, intrigued me, and that's why I, I pursued the career in science. Mm. So <laughs> to university, you were a science major, I presume? Yeah. So uh, I'm a biologist. Here we have very specific courses like that. Yeah. And... Uh, it's not a big university. Science was just starting. And I started in a lab that was uh, really in the beginning. We had just a bench and a sink and a young professor full of ideas. And this kept me motivated and trying to get more and more and more and more sophisticated. And I'm glad that I could do that. <laughs> I remember also as, as a kid, I liked, I was interested in dinosaurs. But then later we found out what we learned was all wrong, right? <laughs> or a lot of it was wrong, right? They, they named them wrong, they didn't exist, or it's really interesting, interesting science to be in, I guess, where everything gets proven wrong. Anyway, it's good that it got you started. Uh, Sue Ellen, how about you? How did you get interested? Yeah, um, since I remember, uh, in the high school, I always wanted to be a doctor, like uh, on the medicine. But I never like a lot to uh, work with people, people. with yeah. the humans. So <laughs> it was hard to imagine how could be. So um, I like a lot of uh, anything about biology. And then I'm, I do the undergraduation with biological science. And uh, I always like to uh, genetic stuff. I did some uh, works in a cytogenetic, but at uh, Federal University of Alavras, the uh, courses in the when I started the graduation, undergraduation was uh, mainly on plants. We have uh, we had lots of um, courses on that on plants, and then I start with the cytogenetic, and uh, something was missing. I didn't know what. But when I was in the end of the biology course, I had some classes with uh, my advisor now, today, about virology. And then I understand that I was in the wrong lab. I go to there, I start to work with her. Maybe it was, I, if I remember well, it's 2008. And since, since that, I was there and just find that I just love how the virus um, 
replicate and how it can uh, be different from the other organisms. And I didn't need to work with people, and that was all right. <laughs> not with uh, like health, with disease, not with humans, but with plants. My uh, master and PhD actually is in uh, plant pathology, so it's almost medicine, but for plants. <laughs> Well, you still have to work with people, of course, because... Oh, yeah, of course, but not with disease. Not on and them. <laughs> yeah, I need, don't need to, to yeah, you don't uh, have to say it. understand okay. the pen and <laughs> anything like that. But, Eurico, you don't have this problem of working with patients, right? No, no, actually no. Uh, but uh, working in the lab with viruses is much more fun. Yeah. Way more fun. So you don't see patients anymore, right? No, I don't. Has been in a long, a long time, and it's danger. It's a danger if I if I try to see a patient now. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's next talk a little bit about uh, the science that uh, you have done. You, I know you're in Aerico's lab. Tell us, uh, and I heard you talk the other day about Oropuche virus. Is that yes. that's yeah. what your main project? Did I say that yeah. correctly, Oropuche? Yeah, we, here in Brazil we say Oropoche. Oropoche, but, uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, it was, the virus was discovered in Trinidad, which is a uh, part of the Commonwealth. Uh, they speak English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I asked oh, for a Spanish-speaking person, how do you pronounce the name? They said Oropuche. Oropuche. So maybe, okay. yeah, maybe Oropuche. Right. But uh, here you say Oropuche? Is it? Oropoche. Oropoche, okay. Yeah. How do you say it? E. coli or E. Coli. E. coli. Yeah, see, in, in the United States, we all, we all say coli. Who says coli? Yeah, Jeremy and, and Michael, yeah, <laughs> the Americans. Who says coli? The rest of you. <laughs> okay, you say something else. Some people didn't raise their hand. <laughs> all right, tell us about your science. Um, when I started at uh, Eurico's lab, he was the main the main project there was, was respiratory viruses. And there was a guy working with, uh, with Oropushi. And I didn't go for what the, most of the people was doing. I, I, I'd like to, to work with uh, Oropushi virus. So we, we started doing, um, to study the, the replication of the virus in, in HeLa cells. And we found out that it induced uh, apoptosis. And that was, um, apparently, uh, the virus needed to, one of more of the, its uh, uh, proteins to be synthesized for the phenotype of apoptosis to occur. So we, we thought that was uh, really interesting. So we wanted to go further with, with this. And... We cloned the, the protein and we started doing some heterologous expression of uh, one of the non-structural proteins of the virus. And then we also wanted to do, uh, to create recombinant viruses by reverse genetics. By what? What? <laughs> what uh, yeah, that? I, I am, emph uh, what, uh, the reverse what was, genetics. What was that word, reverse genetics? Yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> emphasizing the word <laughs> reverse genetics because when I told to, um, okay, just a little parenthesis. parenthesis. Mm -hmm. I went to do this at Richard Elliott's lab in Scotland. And when I told him by email uh, a while ago that I was going to be with, uh, that Vincent was going to be here and he, he was going to watch my oral presentation, he said that I should emphasize reverse genetics because he doesn't like this term. So. I was doing reverse so, so genetics. So he listened. He listened to Richard Elliott. Can you yeah. <laughs> okay. So you said that Oropuche is second most common arbovirus, uh, arthropod-borne virus in Brazil after dengue. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And what does it do to you? Uh, it causes um, a disease that's very similar to, to dengue uh, disease. It's an acute febrile illness with lots of uh, arthro arthrogia. Arthralgia. Mm -hmm. Arthralgias, yeah. Yes, yes. And prostration. Uh, the person stays in bed for one week, or one mm -hmm. week and a half. It's a very acute febrile illness. Okay. There are some, some episodes of uh, the virus has also been isolated from the central nervous system for mm -hmm. the, from the periphery. 
And um, so there are some cases of uh, meningitis and probably encephalitis, but mm -hmm. that's the, they are very, very uh, few cases, and reported what, what cases. What is the, uh, it, the vector for the infection? The vector is uh, the culicoides mosquito. Okay. Uh, now, this mosquito is really, really famous because uh, it was famous worldwide for transmitting the blue tongue virus disease. Uh, but now there is a new bunya virus. Oropuchi uh, is a bunya virus, okay? Just, and um, there's a new one called Schmallenberg that is also uh, transmitted by the same uh, genus of mosquito. So uh, the culicoids okay. mosquito. Okay. So, I don't know, I think I interrupted you. You were talking about uh, ex producing one of the proteins in cells, right? Yes, we are doing the by heterologous expression mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. one of the viral non-structural proteins because it was shown for other Buna virus that is uh, in, related to inducing apoptosis and also to inhibit the interferon pathway. So we were, that was the first candidate, obvious mm -hmm. candidate in the phenotype that we observed. Okay. And then we wanted to create a virus without this protein. Okay. So th for that, you had to create an infectious clone. Yeah. Right. And there's just a little, little bit about this because it's, I, I think it's a very interesting information because we, we didn't they have the system in Eurico's lab, but we, we could uh, try to develop it. Mm -hmm. But I, I asked him if I could just write to someone to see if we could get a collaboration. Or, and he gave me, he said, oh, yes, okay. So I, of course, we, if you study Bunia viruses, you know that Richard Elliott is one of the, the top scientists in the field. And I was kind of, uh, should I write to him? Would, would he reply to my email? Because we are kind of this, when we are studying, we, we feel that we, the things that we do are not important. But he replied in two days. And he said, okay, you can come here and do whatever you want with the Rapucci. I'm interested in it. So if you want to, I guess this is kind of a, an example, just mm -hmm. don't be afraid to write to the top ones. <laughs> yeah, especially, you know, in the old days, we had to make telephone calls. Yeah, it's easy. You, you, that you was just hard. Type. That was hard. But email is easy. What, the worst that happens is they don't answer, right? So for sure, you should definitely email anybody that you want to email. So, and you went to his lab for one year? First I went there for four months when he was at uh, St. Andrews. It was 2010. We cloned the three segments. Bunia viruses have three segments. And uh, the reverse genetics, uh, the system, we, we, we just couldn't uh, rescue recombinant virus at that time. Right. And I, went, I had to come back. I started doing other things related to chickens too, that's what we, uh, Eurico said. And then last year, I went back there at the CVR, the Center for Virus Research that they have now in Glasgow, and which is a very nice center for virus research. And um, with the help of a PhD student, Natasha Tuston Luno, you have to write down this name because this girl, she's brilliant. She's going to write the, in the future, the next chapter of Bunavirid in the Fields Virology book. I'm pretty sure about this. And together, myself and her, we managed to, to do the reverse genetics. <laughs> Excellent. So the, um, the ability to go to another lab in another country, which I, I said before is common to everyone here. This is part of a program Eureka is a program that you have at the university? Uh, yeah, well, there is a big effort now on, this, on the part of the government to fund uh, students to, to go abroad for a period of time. Uh, they have to come back as a requirement, uh, which is good. And um, yeah, so there is this okay. wave now of Brazilians going abroad for studies, and this is being funded. It's interesting that you say they have to come back. You think some of them would not come back? Oh, sure. Oh, we look at they all nod, yes. <laughs> Did you enjoy this year in uh, Glasgow? Oh, yes, a lot. So if you could stay there, would you stay? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I, I wouldn't. No. 
it's, it's really hard to say. You, you shouldn't make these kind of questions, but I would because it's a really nice place to be, but I, I would always be feeling like I want to succeed in my own country. I have this, this is something that is particular of me. I don't know if any other people think like this because um, we know it's harder here, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. we, we have proofs here. You just watch the, the posters and uh, observe the posters and the oral presentations from people that have never been abroad and they're great scientists. So, yeah, I think that many people, I would come back. I think many people feel that way. Um. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, in science, you have to answer and ask tough questions. So, I mean, you had a great answer, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Cynthia, uh, wh whose lab are you working in? Who's your PI? Uh, it's Dr. Paula Howe. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are you working on? Uh, now I'm working with, with uh, hepatitis C. I've been working since uh, my master's with hepatitis C. Uh, but in the beginning, we had a project that uh, it was the idea, the initial idea of the project was to see if uh, mutas, mutations in NS5A uh, had something to do with the response to therapy. So NS5A is a non-structural protein from hepatitis C virus and uh, the literature is uh, kind of controversial but uh, there was strong evidence that some mutations in some of the regions of this non-structural protein could have something to do with the interferon response. So, but most studies uh, were done with uh, genotype 1, which is the most pre prevalent worldwide. Uh, but here, the second most prevalent is genotype 3. So we had some samples from genotype 3 patients, and uh, we, could, uh, we had samples to, through time. So uh, pre-treatment, during treatment, and after treatment samples. So we thought, okay, let's see how this works for genotype 3. And uh, we could not do any kind of relation with a specific mutation or, or with the specific region, variability in a specific region with the response to therapy. Uh, so the project, since it was a PhD and then um, first a master's, then a PhD project, we had to finish it somehow. So it became more like a study of the evolution of the virus through t treatment. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a great way to go. And uh, it was very nice. But uh, in the end of my PhD, I had all the data collected and it was almost done. And I had some time and some financing too because I had a scholarship from FAPESB, which is the... Um, funding agency from the state of Sao Paulo and they allow you to go uh, to other countries to do some kind of research doing, during your PhD uh, as long as it's only for six months. So I had short time but I had the fan financing and I always uh, uh, like the to, to study, the idea to study uh, the way the viral proteins would act and uh, would interfere with cellular processes. So I talked to some researchers and then uh, Dr. Radna Ray from St. Louis University, she said I could go there. And uh, since it was a short time, we just said, okay, let's try to see if uh, NS3 and uh, NS5A, which are proteins known to cause ox oxidative stress, has, has some influence in CERT1. Her lab uh, works with tumor too, so it was something that could be related to HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma. So, uh, but when we got there, the first experiments, we could see, we, we couldn't see any relation. But the thing is, the interesting thing was that uh, we use NS2 protein as kind of a control in two experiments. And we could see that our control was having some effect, some different effect. And we went from there, we did some ex other experiments, and we could see that the NS2 protein had um, an effect in P53 activity through the DNA damage pathway. So 
CHK2 and ATM. So it was a very recent result, which we obtained in short time. So I like this idea to pursue this kind of situation, this kind of uh, study. And then when I ca came back, we decided to do my PhD in this way. So we are studying now the NS2 and the uh, it's ific and DNA damage pathways. So to see the whole figure, because we studied just one uh, way to go. So just CHK2 and then P53 and some other proteins. And we could see that it would uh, abrupt the apoptosis pathway. So um, now I'm seeing how it works in the other proteins of the DNA damage pathway. So, so currently you're a postdoc and you've continued this work, right? Yeah, yeah. Same laboratory? Yeah, with Dr. Paula Howe. Okay. So how did you like this six-month experience in St. Louis? Oh, it was really nice because um, not only scientifically, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean scientifically, but uh, also not only the project, also the way you see other researchers working and how it, the research works in other countries. Uh, it's quite different. Uh, for instance, uh, I had contact with other postdocs and they don't have any specific project. They, have, they work inside a project, so if something doesn't work here, okay, let's mm -hmm. not do this and then let's do something else. Here it's quite different. We have to have one project and we have to do something with that. If that doesn't work, we have to make it work somehow. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, so this was something that really uh, I, I really uh, observed and then I thought th this is nice, this is a difference, a nice difference uh, from us. And, um, but it, it was such a good experience, you know, and I always tell my, my colleagues in the lab that everybody should have this experience even if it's for a short time. Because uh, I think when you have one year you have uh, more possibilities, but with little time, you have less, but even though this is very important thing to do, mm. you know, even to decide if you want to stay here in Brazil, if you want to pursue something here, or if you think you have uh, something else outside. Mm. You know? did, did you want to come back to Brazil? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. weren't there long enough. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I really like the States, you know. Uh, I always did. I studied in an American school, so mm -hmm. I had also the curiosity to live there. So when I went to look for researchers, I kind of focused in the U.S. because of that. And uh, I loved my life there. I miss a lot of things. Uh, but I don't know. This what uh, Gustavo said. It's very true. It's very nice when we, we can succeed in here, even though it's so difficult and that's, yeah, it's difficult. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's very nice. And there's also the family and everything that I, I sure. think it counts a lot. So you, you said you noticed that the postdocs worked differently uh, in the U.S. from here. But is there anything that you, that you learned by going uh, to a, a, a different lab that you could bring back with you and have it influence the way you work here? Sure. Lots of things. Can you give Lots us an example? Let's see. Um, so one thing that, uh, because here, since we have this structure and uh, we have some deadlines, like when we are in master's and mm -hmm. PhD, we are always doing the experiments and we focus on finishing the thesis or the master's, um, the dissertation. Uh, there, I learned to look at the the ongoing project as a paper, hmm. you know, as a way to show it to the scientific community. So uh, my, my, uh, the PI from the lab I went, she had an expression that she used to say, okay, this is a good uh, figure for the paper. <laughs> Let's think about that, you know? And I think this makes uh, things uh, go smoothly. Because if hmm. you think, okay, I'm doing this, but is this going to tell some uh, good information that I can tell the scientific community and is this going to be relevant? You know, for a thesis maybe, but uh, sometimes since when we finish the thesis, th thesis people are going to uh, want to know 
about more about the papers you published, maybe that's a way to also look, you know, not only for the thesis format, yeah. but also uh, for what we can uh, do with the paper. So that, that was something really nice. And when I'm doing my experience today, okay. Uh, and sometimes we have to go back, you know, when we are doing the paper writing. Oh, I should have done this photo of the cells. Have to do again the experiment. Because we, we don't think about that. And now, I go, okay, I'm going to take all the pictures. And if I use, I use. If I don't, that's okay. Yeah. But uh, that, that's a good uh, experience that I got from that. Great. There. Wonderful. Tatiana, what, what do you do? What are you working on? Well, I'm, I'm a little different because I started working with viruses after my postdoc. So I, I entered the virology field in my postdoc. So your PhD was not on viruses? No. And uh, your postdoc was not? No, it my postdoc was. was, was okay. my training. Who, uh, who's your postdoc uh, mentor? Was Jack Johnson, John Lee Johnson. So your postdoc was done entirely in the US? Yes. You didn't start I, I did a, just one year in Brazil after I finished my PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Just. It uh, was a time to finish writing papers and looking for uh, a postdoc. I, I, I really wanted to change fields and have an experience abroad. Okay. So, so how did you identify Jack Johnson's lab to go to? Oh, and that's another thing that I'm learning. You can't always predict things. I would yeah. never think about becoming a virology before. but. At this year that I was searching for um, a postdoc, a new field, something different that I would couldn't get in Brazil, I just happened to to be in a talk that Jack Jack went to Rio to a meeting and he stopped in our institute and he gave a talk and it was fascinating. I was really really hooked, as you say, and. But uh, I didn't imagine that he would invite me uh, because I was not a virologist. I was not doing any, uh, I was not a crystallographer. So Jack is a, he works with virus structure and function. But I asked some questions and he invited me and it was great. I was afraid in the beginning because it's a big change for a, f a short period of time, but I, I'm 100% happy that I, I took it. It's it's tell, so tell us what you worked on in his lab. In, in Jack's lab? Yeah, so Jack, uh, he worked with uh, insect viruses. Well, he worked with many viruses, but one of the uh, lines of research that I took is an insect virus that we know the structure very well, and we can control the maturation steps or how this capsid uh, become ready to infect a cell. And we know the structure of all these intermediates. And we wanted to ask a simple question, but it, that it was hard to answer. Because this insect virus is, was very simple virus. Uh, the whole capsid is made of just one kind of protein, uh, 240 copies of just one kind of protein. And uh, we we were wondering if the position of these uh, proteins in the capsid would matter to the function they perform. It's the same protein, but would the structure matter to define function? Viruses are known to optimize the genome, code many proteins from just a single strand of DNA, and maybe the same protein could do different things in the capsid as well. But because it's the same protein, uh, you cannot introduce particular mutations in any specific um, um, place in the capsid. You would change everything. But because this virus, it matures, and during maturation, it cleaves to um, generate a small peptide that we know was active against membranes. And we didn't know if it was all the, cap the, the peptides that matter to the lytic activity or you have a specific region in the capsid that, sh that are doing uh, that, they are attacking the membrane. But with the structural work, we knew that different regions in the capsid, they cleave in different time. So the cleavage is a slow process. You start with just few subunits cleaving and then others and then others. With the structural work, 
we could see that the tips of the, the capsid cleaves first, and then you have the, 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 last, the other subunits cleaving. And with this structural information, we took this partially cleaved particles that just have the tip cleaved, and they have 100% uh, activity against membranes. So even though the maturation process is very slow, you just need this first subunits to cleave in the tips of the capsid, and you have activity. So for me, that was a very nice example how structure should be linked with uh, functional work to understand systems. And I've, I'm just happy that uh, I went there and now I can proceed here in Brazil with this kind of approach. So I heard Jack present some of his work this summer at the International Congress of Virology in Montreal. And I heard you present it the other day. And as I told you the other day, I understood it better when you presented it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack taught me well. <laughs> <laughs> you got the good parts of him, I guess. So did you really enjoy California? Yeah, I, I enjoy it uh, many things. Well, life is, is good in the U.S. It's sometime, uh, how can I put it? It's, it's easier, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, here we feel that we are fighting with the traffic, with the, I don't know, I live in Rio, it's a big city. And I was in San Diego, a very relaxed city, so it was good to be there. And I was in the Scripps Research Institute, which is a mm -hmm. very international institute, so I made great friends. Jack's lab, uh, I have very good friends there, and I'm very brilliant people, I'm sure they will be brilliant PIs, and mm. I'll, I'll keep collaborating with them. Did you want to come back to Brazil? Yeah, it's like he said. Well, I need to mention something that is very important now. So I got a different fellowship. It's not a Brazilian fellowship. It's the Pew Latin American Fellow uh, Program for Biomedical Science. So Pew is a, an American uh, institution. It's a charitable institution. And they have a program for science for young PIs in America, which is called, it's called the Pew Scholars. And they have a different program for Latin American students. And the idea is to uh, give an opportunity to young people from South America to come to labs in the U.S. And, and then come back. You also need to come back. This is something from a requirement from the, the fellowship. And what is different from this fellowship is that they give you a small startup grant, a small but very important <laughs> for Brazilian, uh, it, it, if you compare the Brazilian grants and this startup, it's, it's very good money. And also they organize annual meetings where the Pew Fellows from Latin America meet the Pew Scholars and this is a wonderful opportunity to be in touch with very good people and make collaborations. And so this is, was very good as well. Is there anything that you learned while you were there that you could bring back with you that influences your work here? Well, uh, being with Jack, uh, working with Jack was uh, an experience by itself because he's a very motivated, very enthusiastic uh, scientist. And he is a senior researcher and I, 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 I am sure he is the same thing as he was with 18 years old. He's very enthusiastic. And the way he deals with people, the way he motivates people, uh, I'll bring this with me for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's important, right? Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your current job, but we'll get back to that. I want to ask Sue Ellen, who's the PI of your laboratory? Uh, I had to work with Alex Karazab and Dr. Alex has a virology lab in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here and in Brazil, who, who's the PI? Oh, here with a uh, plant virus. It's potato virus Y. And I'm working with uh, Antonia. Antonia. And uh, we have a big problem with this virus in my state because uh, in Minas Gerais is a largest producer of potato in the country and uh, people have a lot of problems with PVY, especially because this virus has 
many and, and many strands, recombinant strands, and it can uh, be more serious because the recombinations uh, some that is like every time that you have a mixed infection, we can uh, eventually have a new recombinant, especially in the tropical countries because we have uh, uh, potatoes on the field more than one time a year, and then that is the reason. Mm -hmm. So what? So you worked on potato virus uh, as a postdoc. Is that correct? Actually, I start on the master. The master big project. The uh, big project start on the master mm -hmm. when I was doing. Antonia's lab. Always every year we go to the field and make like a kind of survey of samples mm -hmm. to try uh, understand what is going with the epidemiology of the the virus. And uh, on the end of my master, we found a very different isolate. And uh, we already started to write a project. Mm -hmm. We already had an, an idea that we could go uh, outside Brazil to do one year during the PhD. And then we have this idea to do the, the project. The project was um, accepted from CAPES that it's uh, financial support. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antonia uh, met Alex on a meeting, on the APS meeting. And then he was very interested on the virus and the features of this uh, specific isolate. Then we started to uh, straight and uh, we started to be in contact to uh, send some isolates to him, and on the end he told, no, the best way is that you, if you can come, you will start the project here. So, on the second year uh, of my PhD, mm -hmm. I was there, and uh, when I back, I had a lot of data to, to start to write the papers. So, so, what did you do while you were in Idaho? Oh, it's Idaho, right? It's Idaho, yeah. Okay. Actually, the city is Moscow. What's that? Idaho. Idaho. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Idaho is one of the largest producers, too. I think Ohio, too. It's the mm -hmm. two biggest. So, um, there, uh, I, I took here around 40 I different isolates. Uh, we tried to take isolates from, like, very... Uh, beginning of the Antonia's career, like in 1985-1983, and she keep it in the uh, virus collection. And I also did uh, different surveys on the field in four different years. Then it's all, uh, around 40 isolates, and uh, in Idaho we started to do the biological characterization, and they did a different biological that I had did here before. And we also do the serological characterization because many recombinations, during the recombinations, genomic recombinations, the isolates have the capsid gene from a different parental, and then it's changed the serology. And um, we also start to do the sequencing of uh, the entire genome, the root genome of these isolates. And uh, it starts to understand what is going on here in Brazil and why we have so such uh, variability here. Mm -hmm. Because in other countries, they also have problems with PVY. But the variability there is not too high like here. They have one, two, or three streams on the field. But then in the winter time, everything stops. The vectors on the field just die. The cycle, the life cycle stops. But here, here is different. The potato uh, goes to the field three times a year, and we always have a uh, high temperature. Mm -hmm. Never the vectors stop to uh, uh, their uh, life cycle. So we have a high incidence, and many times we have a mixture of different strands, and sometimes different virus too. And when the, it's a RNA, RNA virus, so we know that the recombinations can happen very often. And this uh, is a mainly reason that we have such variability. 
between these four, uh, maybe between three isolates from 2008, we had one very special that uh, was the reason of the, pr the project, and it was really a new uh, recombinant. So we could prove that uh, when I still was in Idaho. So is this a sp virus spread from plant to plant by a vector? Yes. Which, what is the yes. vector? Uh, lots of types of aphids. Aphids, mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned you studied the biology. So how do you work with the virus in the lab? Can you, do you have cell cultures or, or do you use plants? Oh, no, no. Just plants. We need plants. to keep the, the virus on the plants. Okay. And uh, we work too. Now we're trying to uh, make an infectious clone mm -hmm. of this virus to try to understand what is the genetic determinant. But for, specifically for potovirus, we, we had a lot of difficulties. Mm -hmm. Around the world, many groups are trying to do that. Yeah. We have it for Carla virus, we have for many other uh, families, but specifically for potoviruses, we don't have. When I was in Idaho, I met uh, Carolyn, Camille Carolyn from France. He was there, uh, he already retired, but he was there just to, uh, like a visitor, researcher, I guess, to work with uh, Keras for a while. And then he told me that in France, they are, was almost uh, create an infectious clone, but they needed to be part, I don't know, divide the, the genome in two, because when they, they put the infectious clone inside the E. coli, it's uh, become toxic and the E. coli dies. Mm. So yeah. that's the right. main problem. So you were in Idaho for a year, is that right? Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I guess you yeah, didn't like it. Yeah, because the project was so big and I could oh, not I finish everything. So, so would, that's would, the only reason. You would like to stay longer than a year, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I would like to be longer to finish okay. everything because I didn't finish 30 isolates yeah. and uh, the, the other 10 isolates we just start, but we saw that they also were interesting, but I didn't have time to finish sure. there. So would you have liked to stay in Idaho forever? Uh, <laughs> I think forever. Forever, no, because um, I'm a very... Um, I'm very proud of Brazil, actually, like I think everything here, sure. because we, we have a good research, and especially in my case, uh, UFLA, Federal University of Lavras, in this one year that I was there in Idaho, mm -hmm. the university like changed 50%, and uh, it's grown a lot. And uh, my, my friends from here told me, oh, the university is very different. You need to see. And then I was there, but my heart was thinking, oh, I need to back. I, I want to be part of this modification of my university. So is there something you learned in Idaho that you can bring back with you and use here in your work? Oh, yes. I, I cannot say everything that I learned. But the main thing for me uh, that I learned that was understand that we need to figure out how to always have time to read. Mm -hmm. Because here in Brazil, sometimes I just read to write, uh, write a paper or write a project, and the, the rest of the time I was in the lab just trying to, to do the things. And sometimes the answers are in some paper or in something that you need to read. Mm. And this is the main thing that uh, I learned that. But I also learned how to work in the lab, I already worked here before I go there, but it was different. The focus is different. And uh, I, I see that, I saw that I could have a good production in one year, more than I could imagine before. So, uh, Eurico, this seems like a great program to send people to other labs. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, actually, I'd like to say a few words about this. Uh, Thanks for having Twiv about this in here, because uh, it's very important that these, especially the younger ones, younger than them, um, that are beginning undergrads <laughs> and uh, that can uh, see this and uh, be enthusiastic about doing the same thing or using this as an example. And, uh, and I, I heard wonderful words from all of them, the four of them. 
but we see uh, Oropulti virus, Abunia virus that causes disease in people, and then uh, how viral mutations influence pathogenesis or re response to treatment. And then this beautiful example of architecture that's uh, the capsid of, of Tatiana's viruses. And uh, viruses are beautiful, you know that I think so. But uh, this is this is a especially elegant uh, way to, to look at it. I think an architect uh, that looks at the virus is, oh, because it's beautiful. And um, in this potato uh, virus that she uh, studies, so all important virus for crops and production of foods and stuff. So, and we have four youngsters, four very young people here, and uh, enthusiastic about coming back and believing that this can be done here in Brazil, which is, uh, the main reason why uh, I wanted to collaborate with you in setting up this tweet. So let's talk a little bit about the future. We can't predict it, but we can talk about it. Gustavo, what's in store for you? Uh, you're, how, mu how much more of the postdoc? What do you need to do? And what's beyond that? Well, uh, this, is one huge, uh, this is one huge difference that we have here as compared to the US and the European system. There, you can be a postdoc and work as a postdoc like, if you want for the, for the rest of your life. Here, it works like a tic-tac. Uh, you cannot do this for the rest of your life because the funding, the funding is very good. I have to say, the, the salary for a postdoc is the same or even more than what we have abroad. So this is not a problem. But we have a, a time that you have to finish and start looking for other things. Unfortunately, now, industry is not a very nice decision because the, our park of uh, industrial biotechnology companies is just kind of a starting. We have some very nice companies, but not that much that could give job for everyone that's watching here. So the idea is just to while you are in your postdoc, try to publish as much as you, you can, doing collaborations with other Brazilian um, um, groups and groups from Europe or the USA, and try to get into a good university, a public university, which are the best universities here. So every year there are lots of positions and people just, uh, I don't know the name in English, but it's, a, it's kind of a, they analyze your CV and you give a class and whichever is the best day. So my idea is to continue what I'm, I have been doing, the collaboration with Professor Eurico and Professor Richard Elliott, and try to uh, go further with the study in the Oropuchi virus and try to get a job in a good university. <laughs> so when is your TikTok postdoc up? My TikTok, I guess I have to, to go back to the numbers, but I think I have three more years or something three years. like this. Yeah. Is that right, Enrico? Yeah, it's about right. Okay. It's, it's about se I think it's about seven years since you get your PhD. Okay. Um, yeah, or something like this. Okay. Cynthia, what's next for you? Okay, uh, I guess Gustavo said pretty much what, what's the situation of all postdocs here and uh, but my TikTok is kind of shorter than his and uh, <laughs> it's ending next year uh, probably May and uh, and the idea is that um, we have some research institutes also in Brazil but uh, there are few and it will also work like he said you know you apply for a position then uh, everybody is evaluated at the same time sometimes you have to do a task sometimes uh, only interview and classes and then but uh, of course uh, we don't have they don't have like positions for everybody so that's why we're talking about being hard it's it's a hard stage of the the scientific path to get to an academic uh, position at a university or even just in a research institute but uh, since what we like to do, and as we stated, we want to stay here. That's what we have to pursue, and we have to believe that somehow we'll get there and work to get the papers and all the things that will get us, us there. You know? So what, uh, how would you say your chances are for 
getting a position that you want? Oh, right now is not a good time to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I applied for some and it didn't work out. So, uh, but no, 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 I'm just kidding. I, I, I have to believe, you know, I'm okay. doing my best and uh, uh, I think I'll get there. What, what are your chances, Gustavo? Oh, my chances? Yeah. Of getting what you want. He has seven uh, years, you know. He's got. No, no, I don't have seven <laughs> years. I, I, I said that most of us have seven years after the PhD. I'm, I'm almost done. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of old. So, uh, um, I don't know. What, what's the question? What's question? your? What do you feel about your chances? Do you feel positive or? Oh, I feel that something's coming up. This is going to be 2015. Yeah. You see. So you're positive. I am. Okay. Yeah, I, I try to think I'm really positive about this. So, Tatiana, you have a position. You're really lucky, right? You just yeah. started recently? Yeah, two months ago. <laughs> Was it hard to get one? It is. Yeah, yeah, it is. I don't know if you are familiar with the process in Brazil. Most of the places yeah. you need to go through a written test, which is um, undergraduation knowledge mainly, mm -hmm. but you need to show that you are beyond that. And you need to write all of this in four hours. And then you need to give a lecture that usually mix up some graduation knowledge with uh, top science, uh, something very new. You need to show that you, are, uh, you know the field very well. And, and then you have an interview, which is more like the American system interview, where people ask about your research, what your plans are, and that's it. So it's, it's really hard. It's only uh, going through that, it's, it's physically hard. It's a week mm. of... And so I see very bright people with uh, the best chances that they just don't get the, you know, the technique to go through all that. You, uh, yeah. you need a training for that. So if you, if you don't get a job, what, what do you do as a PhD in Brazil? Well, uh, or you, you, you stay as a postdoc, going mm -hmm. from one lab to another, mm -hmm. or you try your chances in other institutions. We have a few that are uh, just research institutions, mm -hmm. but uh, mostly our, uh, we don't have private uh, centers for research, actually. Mm -hmm. So most of the positions, you depend on, on the government to have openings, and so it's not like in the U.S. that you can actually be, uh, uh, go th uh, for jobs. You really need to wait until you have openings and then you apply. Well, we have a problem in the U.S. right now. We have too many PhDs and not enough positions and people end up doing different things not related to what they originally wanted to do. And so there's a lot of talk that we're training too many PhDs, which is sad because science is the best it has ever been and it's crazy that we don't, can't employ more scientists, so that has to be fixed. Um, so I, I guess it's a similar situation in general. Um, what are you going to do in your lab? What are you, what are you going to work on? So uh, I brought the system. I, I learned with Jack, the virus I was to work there. And um, I have several questions on this mm -hmm. project that I want to answer, and this is good because it will um, keep me busy for the first years. But then things are dynamic. I'll look for another questions. I think mm -hmm. this meeting was very good for me. So as a young virologist, at least on the time that I've been working with viruses, just talking with people was great. And I'm sure uh, new collaborations will come up. So this is a good feature of a PI that they let you take a project with you, right? Not everyone does that. That's true. In fact, that's a good thing to look for when you're looking for a a lab to make sure that that's possible. Yeah, and not only I'm taking the project, but also collaborations. I keep collaborations in the U.S., so that's that's really great. Do you have any worries about starting off on your own? Um, it's well, I, I've been in science in Brazil, my masters and PhD, so I know how things work. Mm -hmm. I, I expected that 
it's difficult. We start with little money, uh, especially in Rio. Sao Paulo is a richer state, and they have more money for... <laughs> for it's not richer, but I think they have a, be a better uh, policy for mm -hmm. science. So we are getting, we are, we are getting very good in, in Rio as well. I can't complain, actually. Um, but uh, I knew how things would be. We start associated with um, senior PIs, so you do your research with other people all the time because you need help for the reagents, for the equipment, yeah. and that's the way it is. And I, fortunately, I know people. I, I am in the university where I did my mm -hmm. PhD and master's, so I have my collaboration uh, network, sure. and this is very important in Brazil. Yeah. So you're positive. Yeah, I'm positive. Good. That's why I come back. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Ellen, what's in store for you? Uh, yes, my project, I, have, I still have three, or actually two and a half a year. And uh, after that, I will start to, to really thinking what I want to do. Actually, I, I like a lot to work here with my my project but we needed to think about it. maybe we need to change or we needed to change it uh, like her did change the the focus totally we need to change for another virus uh, type of research but I don't know I have it this time yet and I still have a take another project I'm inside the seven year that he said but uh, I would like to be a professor because I love it, and I also love uh, do research. And uh, I think I only can do that inside a university or an institution uh, that we have here. And in the last years, we have the government are creating a lot of new institutes. Then that is my focus for now. But mm -hmm. I don't know if the research in that institutes will be uh, would be good or not because it's the very beginning. But if nothing happens here in Brazil, um, Alex already invited me to back to Idaho, but it's not my first option. I would mm -hmm. like to stay here and uh, get a position in some university. So that's a good point. So if you, if you could get a position in another country, you would take it, you're saying, right? Oh, yes. Even if a while, just like a postdoc for two and a half year or three years. Yeah. But uh, in my heart, I would like to back sure. and keep trying a position here in Brazil. All right. So, Cynthia, if you got a job in another country, would you take it or would you want to keep trying here in Brazil? Okay. <laughs> I want to keep trying. Yeah. But I understand there's a limit, you know, right. of trying because you have to survive. But uh, I would... <laughs> But I would prefer really to be here. here. Yeah. Would you take a job in another country? No, yeah. I would say here, if, even if I have to go to a place just to teach, yeah. where I cannot do research, I'd rather teach because I love teaching. Mm -hmm. I love to see people looking at me while I speak. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you got it here. <laughs> and, so I would rather stay here because we have really good positions for teachers. Yeah. Even if you cannot do research at the first three or four years, but you get paid well and you get attention. Okay. Yeah. So you like showing <laughs> off, huh? Not show off, but I, I like to speak, to talk about viruses and I like to people know why we love this, right. this, this, this thing so much. Uh, Vincent, right. yeah. uh, a good point is that if he, we are working outside the country, we always can do the connection. I think Brazil now has a good connections in almost all universities in some, all states of the US and some of the Europe. Mm -hmm. So even if you are working on another country, you always can do some connections, especially because we are going, going to another country, but we always have connection mm -hmm. from the previous lab here in Brazil. So we can do a collaboration together right. and Collaboration to, to, to Brazil, the research Brazilian. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. All right, I have two quick questions for uh, all of you. We'll go right down and then we'll, we'll finish. First question, 
What, if you could fix one thing about science in Brazil, what would it be? Oh, that's easy. Well, <laughs> 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 no, that's one thing. That it's what is really, really what makes uh, the difference. Apart that uh, Europe has been doing research for more than 300 years, the Americans have copied the Europeans in the end of the 19th century, and we are doing the same 30 years from now, or 40, I don't know. But um, the thing that needs to change now, because we know how to do everything else, but the thing that needs to change is the way that things, from important things, get here. The, the time that, I think this is the major problem, mm -hmm. because we are clever, we are smart, and everything. But uh, the time lapse between ordering a particular reagent and the thing getting here, takes a lot because of the customs, it's, it stays there. Maybe because of bureaucracy or some other weird and unmentionable problem. <laughs> but the thing is, when this changes, we will be able to do research quickly and not stop spending public money with bureaucracy and things that just okay. makes it better. Cynthia, what do you think? What, if you could change one thing about science in Brazil, what would it be? Okay, uh, I think Gustavo is quite right, because uh, uh, apart from all the time it takes, sometimes it gets ruined during the way. We have mm. cells that got ruined once, and uh, it's very, very annoying. and uh, It l delays a lot, and thinking that we have all these schedules and, you know, in master's, PhD, uh, but I think the thing I th talked uh, before, you know, s uh, regarding the PhD, and then uh, you don't, since we have to submit only one project, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't mean that we work in only one project. We work in few, but uh, we have to give results from that project, and uh, the PhD time and effort could be more um, uh, better. Uh, uh, used by you having more mobility, you know, to work, uh, okay, mm -hmm. I have this, I did this, and I did that, not get stuck in one project. Because when you become a PI, if you become a PI, when you become a PI, uh, you have to manage that. So it's, it's a path, you know, you, in the beginning you can only work in one and a few, and then you have to work in lots of them. But uh, if you have this kind of structure that just you don't. You, you have to do something about that project. I think that's something that okay. should be changed. Tatiana, <laughs> we have so much bureaucracy to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, hiring people, buying stuff, spend your money, justifying all the what you buy. It's just time-consuming. It's energy-consuming. It's we, we need to change that. We need to okay. give the university freedom to hire people, to, to spend the money. We need, this is something very important. All right. Sue Allen. Yeah, I think uh, they told everything, especially about the orders and the time consuming. Mm -hmm. And that is the main problem. I think if that change, we will have uh, uh, the boom of production and everybody we can finish first and uh, duplicate. Okay. The, the papers. All right, last question. If you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have done? Oh, I would be a musician. A musician? Yeah. Would I play in a, in a rock and roll band. So okay. Okay. I was just going to play music. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Cynthia. Okay, I, I often think about this question and I get to the same answer, you know, I, maybe I wouldn't do it exactly what I'm doing today, but I think I would always be involved in science. I like architecture today, but I don't have the skills to do anything like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. so I'll probably go to research. If I couldn't go to the area I went, I go to, I would go to another uh, field of research, but always research, I okay. can see. Tatiana. I would say paleontologist, but this is also science. <laughs> I would be a horseback riding instructor. Oh, I love horses. Interesting. <laughs> do, you ride, do you ride horses? Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> very good. And Sue Ellen. Um, 
Oh, it's a hard question. But uh, the first thing that came in my mind is uh, teach child, children, and uh, keep working with education. Mm -hmm. But if I can't work with research, I would like to teach these small children and uh, try to uh, help him become uh, good adults mm -hmm. and good professionals. Hey, Rico, what about you? You're an old guy, but you can still answer. Well, to, this, to, to the question of what to change in Brazil, I think I would change the tenure system. We have an awful tenure system. Mm -hmm. okay. Lots of people who are basically doing nothing and uh, occupying lots of positions because they are tenured for life. And, uh, and this is bad. Uh, I would change that. Uh, you have to be reevaluated, and you only keep your job if you're good. This is, this is my way to think about it. But what I would be if I was not a scientist? Probably just waste away in Margaritaville somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Because this is all I, I always thought about doing. You guys have any questions for me? Oh, actually I do. Good. Uh, I, I've been in more than one of your talks about general virology yeah. and how viruses shape the tree of life and this kind of thing. And when are you going to write a book for everyone, not, not just for scientists, but for, for the architectures and the musicians and the mm. people to know about this? This is just, is this a project that you have in mind? I do. I think about it a lot. I would love to do that. Uh, I don't know when. Uh, because I do a lot of other things, I don't have any time. I ran out of time. Uh, I wish I could borrow someone else's time. I thought, like a ghostwriter. Yeah, I, oh, no, not a ghost. I'm thinking of, you know, if other people have time that they don't need, they could rent it to me, but, but that doesn't work. But maybe sometime in the next 10 years, I would like to do something, really. But I want to do a good job. It has to be done right, and I'm still thinking about it, but that's... I would love to do that. Yeah, but I, and I think everybody thinks it's going to be amazing. I hope so. I, I certainly love viruses just like all of you do. And uh, if you asked me what I would have done... That's what I was going to do. What would, would you, you like be doing know? if you're not you? I don't want to do anything else. This is the only thing I want to do. It is. So this episode of TWIV and all the others, we have th over 300 episodes. They're all free. You can find them at iTunes and twiv.tv. And usually on our episodes, we do email. We didn't have time for that today, but we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. And I want to th thank uh, my guests for participating today. Gustavo Akrani, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Cynthia Bitar, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Tatiana Dimitrovic, thank you. Thank you. Sue Ellen Galvino Costa, thank you very much. Thank you. And my good friend Eurico Arruda, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jason. Thank you, man. And um, I hope you enjoyed this. As I said, this is the future of Brazilian virology, and of course you out in the audience, you're also the future uh, as well. I want to thank you for having me, I want to thank you for coming, and I have to tell you this is my second time in Brazil, and I never feel more welcome and surrounded by more friendly people than when I come here, so I really appreciate it. I think you guys are really great. <laughs> And uh, we have a Facebook page for the show, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology. It's all one word. And I've been posting pictures there of, uh, I've, I've had a lot of pictures taken with you guys. It's really neat. And uh, you can find them there. Uh, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>